Well, there I was making this video about crazy bonkers Britain with its net zero policies, going into some detail on each policy, but doing it fairly quickly, when Rishi Sunak, our Prime Minister, decided to give in to a little bit of public pressure. So what I'm going to do now is show you the first part of the video I was preparing before he did the speech, and then I'm going to dissect his speech, because it really does need dissecting. <laughs> Our first bonkers policy, policy number one, is forcing UK car makers to subsidise their Chinese competitors. Hard to believe? Let's take a look. Yes, that's our Prime Minister there. He's looking at his vision there. He's looking at this marvellous vision, which is for the car makers in Britain to subsidise their Chinese car competitors. Because the Chinese are about to flood the world market with cheaper electric cars. They're still expensive by most standards, by the way, so don't get too excited. But, but they're, they're going to be all electric. Next year, 2024 in the UK, every car maker has got to sell 22% electric. If they sell a car over that, they face a penalty of up to £15,000 a car for selling it. But don't worry, they can buy a credit. They can buy an electric car credit and income the Chinese. So the Chinese come in, now they're selling 100% electric, so they've got their 22% easily, and they've got 78% of spare credits to sell. So they can sell to the British manufacturer and say, well, you're going to pay £15,000, fine, we'll charge you 8000 we'll charge you 5000 10000 whatever it is, per car. And then you can sell that car using our, our credit. Yeah. Now, if that isn't bad enough, and it is truly bonkers, I hope you'll agree, it actually rises. And by 2028, 50% of the car sales have to be electric. 50%. And so they're having... Now, the Chinese are still in the marvellous position. They can afford to sell the credits. So this is a huge subsidy to the Chinese. <laughs> huge subsidy to the Chinese at your expense, because every petrol car, a diesel car, is going to carry this penalty. Now, not only that... EV sales are falling at the moment. People do not want them in great volumes. I'm not against EVs at all. I'm against people being forced to buy things for the wrong reasons. I mean, EVs actually add add to the carbon footprint by a long way, way over internal combustion engines, but that's another story. So there we are. There is the first mad policy of bonkers Britain. Now, how could an intelligent prime minister or intelligent set of leaders or intelligent set of MPs actually back this sort of policy, actually basically demolish the car industry? But that's what they're doing at the moment. And in Germany, BMW and others have really warned of this. They're seeing the end of the European car industry with such mad policies. So there is number one. So what could be number two? Let's have a look. Well, Bonkers Policy 2 is forcing UK boiler makers, that's fossil fuel boiler makers for oil and gas boilers, to pay up to £5,000 fine per heat pump they failed to sell. How does that work? Well, here it is. In the first year of the programme, which is 24-25, manufacturers of fossil fuel heating appliances would be required to sell heat pumps equivalent equalising to 4% of the UK gas boiler sales exceeding 20,000 units and 4% of the UK oil boiler sales exceeding 1,000 units. So once you've passed that, you could pay a £5,000 fine for each heat pump you failed to sell. Now just look at that in some detail. There's a run about, you know, well, I think it's 1.8 million homes in the UK that use oil boilers because they've got no alternative. There is no gas, and of course electric is super expensive. So here, I know today, I phoned up uh, with the house I needed to have an EPA rating on, that's the energy rating, and I was told by the EPA official who's going to actually do the work that what boiler does this house have, and the answer is oil. Oh, well, that's a penalty, because you didn't use gas. But I can't use gas. There's no gas supply in the air, it's rural. Oh, it doesn't matter, you still get penalised for not using the gas, you can't get hold of anyway. That is how stupid the world's become. And that leads on, this rating, to you not be able to let out your house or not being able to sell your house because it doesn't meet the correct EPA rating. 
This is truly bonkers Britain. Truly. Bonkers policy number three. Under the net zero strategy, 600,000 heat pumps at a cost of up to £45,000 each will be installed every year until 2028 to replace gas boilers. Well, the UK has about 23 million gas boilers, all heating the oldest housing stock in Europe. Despite attempts to encourage heat pumps adoptions, it's expected that 10 million new boilers will be fitted before 2035. In 2022, about 60,000 heat pumps were fitted to homes in the UK, so we only have 540,000 heat pumps to fit a year to catch up. In other words, all of this is impossible. It's Dreamworld, and that's where our Prime Minister lives, in Dreamworld. Well, let me explain why this target is really impossible. A heat pump produces heat at around about 40 degrees centigrade, compared to a boiler, gas or oil, that produces heat at 73 degrees centigrade. And in your radiators, that's about the temperature that that radiates out. To get the same amount of heat output as your radiators now, be it gas or oil, you need 220% more radiators in your house than you now have. There's a huge cost to that. So the cost goes way past the heat pumps. Also, it's almost impossible in most houses to fit more than double the amount of radiators. The alternative is underfloor heating everywhere. Well, that means ripping up the entire floors, both upstairs and downstairs, of your home. It's not possible. It's simply stupid policies. All for what? Well, we're coming to that at the end of this video, because this is all for nothing. Bonkers policy number four, carbon capture. By the way, technology, that doesn't really exist. Well, never mind, it's going to cost you £20 billion. The scheme also pledges that all electricity will be generated from clean sources by 2035, and that carbon capture will remove between 20 and 30 million tonnes of CO2 a year, by 2030. That's in the next five years, basically. We're going to have carbon capture working to capture all that carbon. <laughs> Truly absurd. And I'll explain why. The world emits about 32 billion tonnes of CO2 emissions a year. So soon at a cost of £20 billion, aims to reduce this by 0.093% which has no measurable effect in any alarmist model, and the cost to you, a total of £20 billion. Well, I was making this video at this point when our Prime Minister decided to start doing a very slight, and I mean slight, U-turn, which I'm now going to dissect. But just to finish this point, and it really deserves a video in itself, there are two types of carbon capture, one from the air and one at the power plant itself. But without going into detail, one study looked at it all and then calculated the amount of energy needed to rid the world, if you like, of its emissions per, per year. And here is the result of that study. Capturing all the world's CO2 output, that's per year, would require more than five times the current electricity supply of the world. And all for what? So we could starve plants of plant food, reduce crop yields and starve people. You would also need to double the world's water supply. This deserves another video in itself. But now I'm going to dissect our Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. So before he even begins his speech, bear in mind this man is under pressure. He's way down in the polls. It looks like Labour, who even worse than him actually, are going to get in. And therefore he has to start bending a little bit the rules. But do not forget this. There are literally hundreds of rules about net zero right through our legislation. Right through it. I've explained a few of them there. And those aren't necessarily being reversed. Nor is the target of net zero by 2050. But there's some easing because within a year here there's going to be an election. So this is a man now who, having made all the mistakes and not done anything until now he's being forced to by public pressure, starts to, let's say, adjust things a little. But we'll see what he has to say. Let me get straight to it. I know people in our country are frustrated with our politics. 
I know they feel that much gets promised, but not enough is delivered. I know they watch the news or read the papers and wonder why, in the face of the facts as they have them, choices are made as they are. I know that they dislike Westminster game playing, the short-termism and the lack of accountability. But most of all, I think people are tired of the false choice between two versions of change that never go beyond a slogan. I've been Prime Minister for nearly a year now, and it is a privilege of my life. I know the fundamentals of our great country are solid and timeless. Its people are its greatest strength, economically and socially. Their hopes and genius are what propel us forward, not government. Government can set the framework, step in when needed, and step back when necessary. It can make big decisions. But what I've concluded during my time so far as Prime Minister is that those decisions, the decisions that could bring real change, change that could alter the trajectory of our country, can be so caveated, so influenced by special interests, so lacking in debate and fundamental scrutiny, that we've stumbled into a consensus about the future of our country that no one seems to be happy with. Oh. We've stumbled into something the country's not happy with. No, we haven't. We've been driven by an agenda, by a doctrine. We've been driven by that doctrine. And you, Prime Minister, have been one of the prime movers with your WEF friends and everybody. You have been pushing it all the way and not compromising. But now, now you're seeing the chance you're going to lose your job, almost certainly going to lose it by the looks of it. You're beginning to grasp at anything you can do to twist things. And my job is to comment as you come up with these changes. And that starts today with a new approach to one of the biggest challenges we face, climate change. No, climate change is not the big challenge that we can do anything about. I mean, we are less, less than 1% of the world's CO2 emissions. Scientifically, the CO2 emissions don't matter in any event at this point. They just don't control the climate. The idea, the concept that CO2 controls the climate is absolutely absurd. So even if you were right, Prime Minister, and somehow CO2 did control the climate, the fact that China, India and all the rest are just building coal power stations as if there was no tomorrow and outputting more CO2 and more CO2 each year Anything we do makes no difference. So what you should do as Prime Minister is looking at the cost of our actions compared to what benefit we get. And you couldn't, if you put the fact that we disappear off the earth as a country and put that into the models, the alarmist models, you wouldn't get any detectable difference in the future. So what you're doing is about to commit the country what I consider to be to three or four trillion pounds on a path to net zero 2050, that you are doing that cost. You are making people suffer with that in all sorts of ways and controls. You're doing that without any possible benefit. No one can watch the floods in Libya or the extreme heat in Europe this summer and doubt that it is real and happening. Well, there we are, some fear-mongering without any understanding whatsoever on even what climate is. You cannot take weather events and say they're climate. If you're going to look at floods, you have to look at them over a long, long period. If you're going to look at droughts or anything else, you have to do that to see what the patterns are. But this man has just cited, let's say, the floods in Libya. And let's just look at the facts here to see actually what happened. That's right. Dire warnings by the Libya dams went unheeded. The state wasn't interested, said an engineer, who published a paper about Dania's dams, after decades of postponed repairs might fail under the stress of a powerful storm. So it was a dam failure caused by the neglect of government. A quote from a report. There were warnings before. The state knew of this well. Whether through experts in the Public Water Commission or foreign companies that came to assess the dam, he said, quote, the Libyan government knew what was going on in the Derna River Valley and the danger of the situation for a very long time. So, Mr Sunak, you have the entire civil service at your disposal and you come up with silly warnings like this. This is the problem. What you're telling everyone is not true. As you're trying to ease people's minds, you're scaring people based on false claims. 
as regards these record temperatures he's claiming, you can forget it. I've done a video on this called The Heat Wave That Never Was. I link it in the description below. If they stop measuring temperatures on runways at Heathrow or at RAF stations with jets taking off, it might help lower the temperatures a bit. We must reduce our emissions. And when I look at our economic future, I see huge opportunities in green industry. The change in our economy is as profound as the Industrial Revolution, and I'm confident that we can lead the world now as we did then. Well, we led the world then, not with government leading, but with individuals leading, with individual enterprise leading, not government, not top-down models. But let me give you some simple facts. China alone makes 50% of the world's wind turbines, 66% of the solar panels, and 88% of the world's batteries. And they also have a real hold on the raw materials to do all that. But what do we do? Well, first of all, after leaving the EU, we rejoin the levy. We enjoin the EU climate levy so that our steel industry has to pay large sums of money, like at the moment £80 million a year, um, for carbon offsetting. So we now penalise the steel industry. On top of that, huge energy costs in other directions have basically removed a lot of our heavy industry and exported it to China. But not to worry. After all that penalising of our steel industry, and in fact a lot of heavy industry in the UK, what we do is we come to the rescue with a green subsidy. So after charging them with green levies, we give green subsidies. It's madness. Well, look at this investment in Tata Steel. First of all, we hand Tata £500 million worth of your money. So there's a green subsidy straight away. This is so they can have electric furnaces and do away with their traditional furnaces down in Port Talbot. Here's the press cutting. Let's read it first. And yet, despite £1.25 billion of new investment, that's because Tata and themselves are putting in £700 million, it is expected a 3000 of the 8,000 people that Tata employs in this country will lose their jobs, 2,000 of them at Port Talbot. This means nearly 40% of the workforce will be sacrificed in the name of net zero. And that story repeats itself. So there's lots of things going on like this, lots of subsidies going on, which are part of the green subsidy. The green policy, the net zero, runs right the way through so much legislation, and is actually law in Britain. Now, many will not realise this, that new electric furnace in Port Talbot can only use scrap steel. It melts down scrap. It can't make our top quality steel used in shipbuilding and everything else. It can't make that. That's up in Scunthorpe, and that's the only plant now we have making proper steel. But look at this press release. By replacing Port Talbot's existing coal-powered blast furnace, well, you're not replacing it. You're doing away with an industry. You're doing away with the manufacture of prime, top-quality steel that we're particularly good at and reducing the entire industry down to just one in Scunthorpe. But that's not told to you, is it? All in the name of net zero. The change in our economy is as profound as the Industrial Revolution, and I'm confident that we can lead the world now as we did then. So I'll have no truck with anyone saying we lack ambition. But there's nothing ambitious about simply asserting a goal for a short-term headline without being honest with the public about the tough choices and sacrifices involved and without any meaningful democratic debate about how we get there. I think that's rich what he's saying here because it's coming from a Prime Minister who has just passed through Parliament a bill the energy bill, which allows him and other ministers to create to create criminal laws um, regarding net zero. So legally they could come in, they can create a law to say it's illegal to have a log fire and the police can come in and, you know, inspect to see if you've got it or not. And so on. It just goes on. Now, that criminal law can be enacted without going back to Parliament. No discussion, no debate. Oh no, they have now got that power. And this is the falsehood of this Prime Minister and this government. It's even worse with Labour, so don't think I'm letting Labour off here. They're even worse. 
but at least now the public pressure is beginning to exert a little twist but it's only a little twist fundamentally nothing is changing and i'll expose that as we go on but i have to say at this point there were 19 MPs who voted against this energy bill in Parliament as a matter of principle. And in the description of this video, I'm listing all the MPs who did that. Right? And those MPs ought to be congratulated for putting principles above their own skins and their own careers, etc. That is the case. So let's praise the ones who have resisted. But that's 19 out of 650. Not very good, is it? But then most of them are a waste of skin that's a new term i've come to use because they're just cardboard cutouts clapping like penguins following a doctrine that's meaningless and by the way which they even have rules in the bbc are you you don't have to allow a common an equal debate with climate change we, we don't have a proper debate about climate change they say it's settled and that's it their actions are totally against what they're trying to portray here. And I want to expose them all the way. The Climate Change Committee have rightly said, you don't reach net zero simply by wishing it. Yet that's precisely what previous governments have done, both Labour and Conservative. No one in Westminster politics has yet had the courage to look people in the eye and explain what's really involved. That's wrong, and it changes now. The plans made on your behalf assume this country will take an extraordinary series of steps that will fundamentally change our lives. A ban on buying new boilers, even if your home will never ever be suitable for a heat pump. A ban that takes effect in just three years for those off the gas grid. And mandatory home upgrades for property owners in just two years time. There have even been proposals for taxes on eating meat, new taxes on flying, compulsory car sharing if you drive to work, and a government diktat to sort your rubbish into seven different bins. Now, I believe deeply that when you ask most people about climate change, they want to do the right thing. They're even prepared to make sacrifices. But it cannot be right for Westminster to impose such significant costs on working people especially those who are already struggling to make ends meet, and to interfere so much in people's way of life without a properly informed national debate. OK, then, let's have a national debate. Let's have a debate on whether net zero itself is sensible. Let's have a debate on whether the CO2 drives the climate. Let's have those debates. But you won't allow that, will you? So what you mean is, let's have a national debate providing we drive and have all the controls. No, sir. No, you're not going to get away with it. That's especially true because we're so far ahead of every other country in the world. We've had the fastest reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in the G7, down almost 50% since 1990. France, 22%. The US, no change at all. China, up by 300%. And when our share of global emissions is less than 1%, how can it be right that British citizens are now being told to sacrifice even more than others? Because the risk here, for those of us who care about reaching net zero, as I do, is simple. If we continue down this path, we risk losing the consent of the British people. And the resulting backlash would not just be against specific policies, but against the wider mission itself meaning we might never achieve our goal. That's why we have to do things differently. We need sensible green leadership. It won't be easy, and it will require a wholly new kind of politics. A politics that is transparent, and the space for a better, more honest debate about how we secure the country's long-term interests. So how do we do that? What is our new approach to achieving net zero? Well, first, we need to change the debate. We're stuck between two extremes. Those who want to abandon net zero altogether because the costs are too high, the burdens too great, or in some cases, they don't accept the overwhelming evidence for climate change at all. Of course there is evidence for climate change. 
But the problem is, is it isn't CO2 that's driving it. That's the problem. There's always been and always will be climate change. We're not denying that. What you call deniers as if it's some sort of witch hunt. I mean, it's only three or four hundred years ago we were burning people when we had bad weather. You know, and we haven't really progressed in sort of our mentality because people like you and your government, in fact, Western governments, all conforming at once to this suicide pact to ruin their economies. I'm sorry, Prime Minister, I am willing to debate. You're not. With many others like me, we are more than willing to debate, but we're censored. You step out of line these days as a scientist and you lose your career. You've got a kids, you've got mortgage to pay for, you've got things to see to. I can't really blame them. But that is the situation and you've got to realise that. But no, no, you're going to take it all as accepted. That's not for discussion. Blair even passed a law so enabling the BBC to be able to just take one side of the climate debate. So climate change is happening, it always will happen, but it isn't man that's driving it. And then there are others who argue with an ideological zeal, we must move even faster and go even further, no matter the cost or disruption to people's lives, and regardless of how much quicker we're already moving than any other country. Both extremes are wrong. Both fail to reckon with the reality of the situation. Yes, net zero is going to be hard and will require us to change. But in a democracy, we must also be able to scrutinise and debate those changes, many of which are hidden in plain sight in a realistic manner. This debate needs more clarity, not more emotion. The test should be, do we have the fairest credible path to reach net zero by 2050 in a way that brings people with us? Since I've become Prime Minister, I've examined our plans, and I don't think they meet that test. We seem to have defaulted to an approach which will impose unacceptable costs on hard-pressed British families, costs that no one was ever really told about, and which may not actually be necessary to deliver the emissions reduction that we need. And why am I confident in saying that? Because over the last decade or more, we've massively over-delivered on every one of our carbon budgets, despite continuous predictions we'd missed them. We've seen rapid technological advances, which have made things like renewables far cheaper. Just consider offshore wind, where costs have fallen by 70% more than we projected in 2016. Who said um, if you tell a lie big enough and for long enough, people will begin to believe it? This claim he's just made about costs of falling offshore wind. The facts are, in the recent offshore wind auction to get new offshore wind farms, no one took it up because even the subsidised price they were offering wasn't high enough. And I've given recent evidence in recent videos. The offshore wind industry was seeking 250% increase in the price. Basically, offshore wind is dead. We have led the world with a stupid experiment at great cost. And don't believe the claims of, well, let's take a claim here. Let's take a look at our great opposition leader, Keir Starmer, at the WEF. You know, one of the things I'd say about renewables is, look, um, we do need to drive down the price. They are, you know, cheaper. In the UK, um, renewables are nine times cheaper uh, than oil and gas. At the moment. It's economic sense to press forward here, to innovate uh, and make sure that, you know, an active state knocks out the barriers. There's no end of... That claim is totally, totally untrue. Look, if renewables were nine times cheaper, they wouldn't need all these subsidies, would they? If renewables were nine times cheaper, they wouldn't need anything. They'd enter the market and undercut everyone, and we'd all be enjoying cheap energy, wouldn't we? But that's not the case. I've done dozens of videos on this. This is a lie the Labour Party are pushing, and it's a lie the Conservative Party are pushing. It is not true. I mean, I wish it was true, but, you know, it's not true. And common sense tells you it's not. Just look at your power bills now and see how it's not. You see, when they give 500 million to Tata Steel, 
that is a green subsidy. It's not counted, are they? But that's a green subsidy. When they have to pay 50 times the normal price to buy in power um, because the wind stops, that's a subsidy, but it's not counted. When we actually pay 50 times the price to give it away because we've got too much wind and the contract forces us to buy it all the time, we don't count it. But even the price now, we're offering the subsidised price, we're offering to offshore wind, they're not taking it. It's not economic anymore. It's dead. We can all pretend, and some politicians, like our Prime Minister, carries on repeating it, Keir Starmer, our probable, our probable next Prime Minister, keeps repeating it. Not true. Look at how demand for electric vehicles has consistently outstripped forecasts. Now, given all these things, I'm confident that we can adopt a more pragmatic, proportionate and realistic approach to meeting net zero that eases the burdens on working people. And that's the second part of our new approach. Now, I'm not saying there will be no hard choices, and nor am I abandoning any of our targets and commitments. I am unequivocal that we will meet our international agreements, including the critical promises in Paris and Glasgow to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. Our Prime Minister actually thinks that we control the climate. He actually thinks that by us limiting CO2, we can control the average temperature of the Earth. He actually thinks this. It is unbelievable. It is totally equivalent to the three or four hundred years ago witchcraft phase, when they believed that by burning witches, you know, they were going to sort of help stop this bad weather. And actually, you can correlate very clearly the witch hunts, the, you know, the burning of witches with bad weather events. They, every time there was really bad weather sequence, and there were far worse in the past, believe me, you know, then bang, the number of burnings of witches went up. This is what he's doing today. It's a modern day equivalent to this. We don't control the temperature of the earth. Mankind can't do it. And the idea that we can have any effect at all anyway is totally, well, it's for the birds. I'm proud that our country leads the world on net zero with the most ambitious 2030 target of any major economy. And as we're committed as ever to helping developing countries. Just the other week, I announced $2 billion for the Green Climate Fund, the single biggest commitment of its kind the UK has ever made. But we can do all of this in a fairer, better way. And today I can set out details of what our new approach will mean for people. That starts with electric vehicles. We're working hard to make the UK a world leader. I'm proud that we've already attracted billions of new investments from companies like Tata's Jaguar Land Rover Gigafactory. And I expect that by 2030, the vast majority of cars sold will be electric. Why? Because the costs are reducing, the range is improving, the charging infrastructure is growing. People are already choosing electric vehicles to such an extent that we're registering a new one every 60 seconds. But I also think that at least for now... At least for now. So in the future, we're going to make all these choices for you. But at the moment, at the moment, we're going to let you choose your own form of transport. Aren't we good? It should be you the consumer that makes that choice, not government forcing you to do it. Because the upfront cost still is high, especially for families struggling with the cost of living. Small businesses are worried about the practicalities. And we've got further to go to get the charging infrastructure truly nationwide. And we need to strengthen our own auto industry so we aren't reliant on heavily subsidised carbon intensive imports from countries like China. So to give us more time to prepare, I'm announcing today that we're going to ease the transition to electric vehicles. You'll still be able to buy petrol and diesel cars and vans until 2035. Even after that, you'll still be able to buy and sell them secondhand. We're aligning our approach with countries like Germany, France, Spain, Italy, Australia, Canada, Sweden, and US states such as California, New York, and Massachusetts, and still ahead of the rest of America and other countries like New Zealand. Now, to get to net zero, 
we also need a fairer, better approach to decarbonising how we heat our homes. We're making huge advances in the technologies that we need to do that, like heat pumps. I've already explained why heat pumps don't work in most houses. You know, they you need 220%, more than double the number of radiators to get the same heat output, or, or you're going to have to rip all your floors up and lay it under floor. So heat pumps are just a waste. But the fascinating thing is today, today I decided not to have an efficiency rating for my home, which is almost 100 years old. And so, you know, uh, I was rated F actually. And so what was it going to be? You know, I've installed extra insulation and done all the normal things. And um, it was pointed out to me that um, the bigger the house, um, the, the, the lower the score, full stop, because it's not based on efficiency. It's actually based on the amount of money you spend on energy. So if you've got a big house, you're going to spend more, so your rating becomes lower. But the fascinating thing was, if you fit a heat pump, because the heat pump is supplied with electric, and electric is more expensive than gas, you're penalised. And by the way, you're also penalised if you use oil, which apparently is more expensive than gas, and because you're not using gas, you get penalised again. It's not an efficiency thing, it's impossible. I have no choice where I live. There's only oil as regards heating or electric. So I'm actually better off with the oil than the electric. The electric's the worst, why? Because it's more expensive. It's almost a circular thing. They make the electricity so expensive and they almost invert their own systems. I, I just can't make sense of it. So don't think your house is based on efficiency, your rating you get. It's based on a ridiculous formula, really ridiculous but there we are but we need a balance between incentivizing businesses to innovate so heat pumps become even cheaper more effective and more attractive but without imposing costs on hard-pressed families at a time when technology is often still expensive and won't work in all homes for a family living in a terraced house in Darlington the upfront cost could be around 10,000 pounds now, even the most committed advocates of net zero must recognise that if our solution is to force people to pay that kind of money, support will collapse and will simply never get there. So I'm announcing today that we will give people far more time to make the necessary transition to heat pumps. We'll never force anyone to rip out their existing boiler and replace it with a heat pump. You'll only ever have to make the switch when you're replacing your boiler anyway and even then, not until 2035. So there we are. They've given you an extra five years before they make you bankrupt with the cost of a heat pump and actually force you into cold, terrible circumstances where you simply can't heat your house properly. It's incredible. So there's no real change here. It's like the condemned man in the cell, you know, is due to be executed, being given a stay of sentence. That's what Rishi Sunak is doing here. Nothing is really changing. It still drives on with the whole agenda. But this gives you a little bit more time for the population to realise what's happening and get these people out of power. Because that's the only way we're going to change this, is to stop voting for the mainstream parties. I don't, believe to, I don't belong sorry, to any political party, but I will urge you to only vote for parties that will totally drop net zero. That's my message. Anyway, back to Rishi Sunak. And to help those households for whom this will be the hardest, I'm introducing a new exemption today so that they will never have to switch at all. Now, this doesn't mean I'm any less committed to decarbonising our homes. Quite the opposite. But rather than banning boilers before people can afford the alternative, we're going to support them to make the switch. I'm announcing today that the boiler upgrade scheme, which gives people cash grants to replace their boiler, will be increased by 50% to £7,500. So there we are, another green subsidy that's going to cost an absolute fortune <laughs> so you can freeze in your own homes. But these subsidies are your money. They're being spent willy-nilly all over the place in the name of net zero. It's absurd. And nothing here is changing. This man is simply trying to hold on to his job. The problem for me 
is that the alternative with Labour is even worse. I can't imagine Ed Miliband as our energy minister. There are no strings attached, the money will never need to be repaid, and this is one of the most generous schemes of its kind in Europe. Next, energy efficiency. Now this is critical to making our homes cheaper to heat. That's why we've got big government grants, like the Great British Insulation Scheme. But under current plans, some property owners would have been forced to make expensive upgrades in just two years' time. For a semi-detached house in Salisbury, you could be looking at a bill of £8,000. And even if you're only renting, you'll more than likely see some of that passed on in higher rents. That's just wrong. So those plans will be scrapped. And while we will continue to subsidise energy efficiency, we'll never force any household to do it. On the face of it, that is good. On the face of it, it is. Providing they don't try to restrict you selling your house and doing things like this according to its energy efficiency. So the devil here may be in the detail. And that's not all. The debate about how we get to net zero has thrown up a range of worrying proposals. And today I want to confirm that under this government, they will never happen. The proposal for government to interfere in how many passengers you can have in your car, I've scrapped it. The proposal that we should force you to have seven different bins in your home, I've scrapped it. The proposal to make you change your diet and harm British farmers by taxing meat, or to create new taxes to discourage flying or going on holiday, I've scrapped those too. And nor will we ban new oil and gas in the North Sea, which would simply leave us reliant on expensive imported energy from foreign dictators like Putin. We will never impose these unnecessary and heavy-handed measures on you, the British people. The total scrapping of these totally insane measures, like you know, telling you what you're going to eat and you can't eat meat, is excellent. But you know, just think about where we are. We're being told the government is no longer going to do these crazy things. Fine, it's good. And the total scrapping without any ifs and buts, I totally support. We're already home to four of the world's largest offshore wind farms. We're building an even bigger one in Dogger Bank and improving our auction process to maximise private investment into this world-leading industry. We're lifting the ban on onshore wind. We're investing in four new clusters to capture and store carbon from the atmosphere. It really is an exercise in futility to use air capture for carbon storage. The amount of energy required to do it and to store it and control it, etc., exceeds any possible saving. Now, quoting some research from America. Operating enough carbon capture to keep the climate crisis in check would double humanity's water use, according to the University of California. Berkeley researchers said, regardless of the method being used on a power plant or capturing directly from the air, more power and more water will be needed, and it'll be needed on a grand scale. It really is an exercise in futility. And we're building new nuclear power stations for the first time in 30 years. Just this week, we took a significant long-term decision to raise funding for Sizewell C. And later this autumn, we'll shortlist the companies to build a new generation of small modular reactors. Good, and I hope this stable salt reactor is in that list. Most of the scientific work I'm sort of leaning towards at the moment is showing that we should be now in a cooling period, and I think we are. And by 2035, we should have reached, you know, pretty cold conditions, as it were. Not as bad as the Little Ice Age, but, you know, going towards that way. And so it's quite going to be, quite, well, it's going to be quite interesting over the next uh, 12 years or so to see actually what happens now as the reality of the climate uh, clashes with the alarmism but my worry is and it's already here we're wasting billions and billions and billions and putting up energy costs needlessly we should be using nuclear and fracking and we shouldn't stop the nuclear in any event um, i would advise those interested in this subject to 
look at my video on the stable salt reactor, which is a modular reactor that eats waste, actually. We've got enough waste to supply the UK grid for 400 years. So there's all sorts of solutions. I'd like research going on into using nuclear to try to make it fast reacting. At the moment, it's like a stable power source and not like gas, which can react quickly. So at the moment, really, we need gas in nuclear. We need 100% gas to back up the renewables. You know, whatever the renewables come to, we've got to back them all up with gas. Obviously, solar at night doesn't work, fully backed up. And when the wind drops, fully backed up. And I've done many videos on this. So there is my, I'm sorry for a big long one, because when I was preparing this video, the Prime Minister started this little bit of a U-turn. But he hasn't changed his spots. Um, it's still the ridiculous thing about getting rid of CO2 or reducing it. And it's still China providing, well, selling us the rope for us to hang our Western economies. I think that's the thought I'll leave you with. The Chinese rope hanging our Western economies. Bye-bye. <laughs>